Uh, hello everybody, this is uh, Statistical Computing and Machine uh, Learning. Uh, today we will be discussing a few more uh, important elements on uh, summarizing posterior distributions uh, and in particular different type of uh, point uh, estimates for the parameters. And then uh, hopefully uh, we will be able, we will have enough time to discuss uh, uh, ideas about uh, Bayesian model selection. All right, so let's uh, see what uh, some of the topics will be. So we will uh, revisit the calculations for the map estimate. And I would like today to discuss uh, a little bit more about the uh, drawbacks of map estimation. Uh, if you remember, we already have seen when it comes to computing the predictive uh, distribution with plug-in estimates, uh, the most sensitive estimate to use to avoid overfitting was the posterior mean. Uh, so today we will see a few more uh, drawbacks of uh, map estimation, some of them related uh, with uh, what's called reparametrization. Uh, okay, we will also discuss about uh, uh, computing uncertainties in our point estimates. So we will uh, have these ideas of uh, uh, credible intervals and high probability density intervals uh, in a Bayesian setting. So we will uh, review briefly some of those things. And then, uh, hopefully in the lecture today, uh, we will uh, cover ideas of uh, Bayesian model selection. We will say several things about um, uh, computing the marginal likelihood or the evidence. Some of these things we have uh, visited them uh, before in our earlier lectures. I uh, will introduce the Bayes factors uh, that allow us to compare two uh, models. And uh, uh, hopefully, um, we will uh, have enough time to uh, bring up the idea of this uh, Bayesian Occam's razor principle, uh, a principle that effectively says that uh, uh, the best models are the simplest models that uh, explain the data. So we will see how this thing comes uh, uh, in a Bayesian setting. So um, lots of goals today for the lecture. We need to understand the drawbacks of the map estimations. Uh, introduce these high probability density intervals uh, and uh, these credible intervals for um, the Bayesian posterior. Uh, learn about different uh, information criteria and um, uh, of course start discussing about model selection, Vegas factors and uh, Occam's uh, razor. And I am going to remind you how we compute uh, model evidence. Again, this will be a repeat of things we have seen uh, in uh, various lectures uh, in the past. And uh, finally, uh, I am going to give you an extremely important approximation of the posterior of the parameters, uh, an approximation that uh, will effectively give us a Gaussian uh, to represent uh, the complicated posterior, even in high dimensions. So the Laplace approximation will be a Gaussian approximation for the posterior. And the reason, of course, we would like to have uh, a Gaussian is that will allow us to do potentially many computations, including uh, the predictive distribution. Uh, maybe we can uh, do the calculation analytically if the posterior can be approximated um, uh, as a Gaussian. Okay, um, so let me uh, start uh, moving forward. And, and uh, so we... Uh, you know, we have seen lots of things about uh, how to compute the posterior and we discuss uh, about uh, point estimates. And I think the post point estimates that um, uh, we discuss include the map estimate, uh, they include the posterior uh, mean. Uh, today we will see the discussion on confidence intervals. Um, someone can also define the posterior uh, median. So again, all of these estimates uh, are extremely important, but obviously they don't represent the complete information that is contained in uh, the posterior P of theta uh, given D. Uh, now, the reason we really want to concentrate on point estimates is because first they are useful. Uh, they provide uh, a, a rapid um, uh, assessment, if you like, uh, or a, a rapid uh, piece of information coming from this high dimensional uh, posterior, and 
in many ways they are easier to understand than the actual posterior that may be difficult to interpret, especially if the vector theta is a vector in uh, high dimensions. Okay, so let me uh, remind you, um, so the map estimate, if you remember, was the estimate of the parameters that uh, maximizes uh, the posterior uh, distribution. And we already have discussed a little bit uh, on uh, drawbacks of uh, using uh, plug-in approximations with a map estimate. And um, still, uh, most of the people that use point estimates, they prefer the map estimate. And the reason uh, for that is that the map estimate is um, easy to compute. It's effectively uh, a call to uh, an optimization algorithm, right? That's what the map is, is the, is the parameter that maximizes uh, the posterior. So it's a nice optimization uh, problem, and that's much easier than actually computing the posterior mean that requires uh, an integration. So that's the reason people use the map estimation. It doesn't uh, necessarily mean that is the best point estimate uh, that uh, uh, we can use. Okay, so uh, now we already have seen uh, the context of plug-in approximation using the map estimate. Uh, and uh, within the predictive distribution, uh, we already have seen that uh, somehow uh, the calculation that we get is prone to overfitting and uh, the posterior mean doesn't uh, have that uh, drawback, okay? Uh, but certainly, uh, it's, a, it's a, an estimate on its own, so somehow we will need today to derive uh, some confidence uh, uh, intervals uh, for this point estimate, something that basically allows us to account for the uncertainties uh, that are contained uh, in the posterior uh, distribution. Okay, so um, uh, let me just say uh, a little bit uh, about this uh, overfitting and using the, the map estimate. I remind you that the predictive distribution was the integral of the likelihood times the posterior integrated uh, over the parameter space. So when you do that integration, basically the predictive distribution that you get, this full Bayesian predictive distribution, uh, does not um, uh, pose uh, any overfitting problem. Okay, The overfitting starts when you start approximating the posterior with a point estimate. Okay, uh, So if we don't model the uncertainty in the parameters, okay, that's when the predictive uh, distribution becomes overconfident, and uh, this uh, can be extremely problematic in many applied cases where somehow uh, you need to make decisions that have consequences, and in that case you need to understand what is the uncertainty that you bring uh, to the picture by using point estimates. Let me graphically give you a few examples of uh, why uh, the map estimate may not be the appropriate estimate that you want to summarize the posterior distribution. So we can see here uh, a PDF, this black curve that you see, has uh, a peak uh, that looks like a delta function. So obviously the map estimate is here, okay? Um, but you can, uh, if you look carefully at the distribution, uh, this map estimate is uh, certainly not representative of the whole distribution and you will be way better off if you actually use the mean as a point estimate rather than using uh, the map estimate. Okay, so let's do a look at uh, another example. So uh, on the picture on the right we have this um, um, uh, gamma distribution which is a skewed distribution and you notice that the map estimate in this case is at theta equal to zero but certainly uh, this is uh, not representative, again, of the distribution, and the mean of the distribution is certainly not uh, theta equal to zero. It's a non-zero value. Now, this particular um, uh, situation that you see on, on the right may actually be uh, uh, very important when you do inference for the variance, let's say, of, for example, a Gaussian distribution, right? So, and you get uh, a posterior that looks like that, uh, certainly, you're not going to estimate, um, use a point estimate for that for this posterior and say that the variance, the point estimate is zero, because that will be not uh, a sensitive uh, uh, estimate for your calculations. So, bottom line, in very practical situations, 
the, using the MAP estimate is not the most sensitive uh, measure uh, and summary of your posterior that uh, actually you can use. Uh, now, how do these uh, different uh, point estimates like the MAP estimate and the MLE estimate and the posterior mean estimate uh, come? And uh, the answer is on decision theory that we may or may not cover later in the course depending on uh, our schedule. But let me just uh, summarize a few ingredients uh, uh, and it, it may be a good idea to actually remember those things. So what um, you can think that we have... Uh, a true value of a parameter that I indicate here as theta, and we need to compute some point estimate, right? Uh, once we collect some data, we need to come up with some point estimate of the true parameter theta that I denote here as theta hat. So uh, the idea in decision theory is we're going to introduce different loss functions that somehow upon minimization will give us different point estimates theta hat. So I'm going to give you a summary uh, of three different cases with three different loss functions that lead to point estimates that you already have seen. So it's a good idea to affiliate those point estimates with uh, these uh, loss functions. So the first loss function is uh, the 0, 1 loss function. That, let's look at the formula here. It says the loss function, so it's a measure of the distance of uh, the estimate theta hat from the true value theta is this indicator function. So if uh, your theta hat is not equal to theta, basically the loss is equal to one, otherwise the loss is zero. That's why we call this the zero one loss. So if you uh, minimize this loss function, then the point estimate that you get is uh, the posterior mode, okay? So uh, the posterior mode uh, corresponds to minimizing the zero one loss uh, and, and, uh, and uh, so that's something uh, useful to remember and actually not very difficult to prove, okay? Now, if you have a quadratic loss, uh, so if your loss is theta minus theta hat squared, then it turns out that the posterior mean is the optimal um, uh, point estimate. And actually, that's also extremely important thing to remember from now on. So the posterior mean is always affiliated with uh, minimizing uh, a square loss. And uh, the third case I want to just briefly mention is when you try to minimize uh, the absolute value of theta minus theta hat. This is what is called the robust loss function. And uh, so when you minimize uh, this loss function, uh, the point estimate comes to be the posterior median. We haven't actually seen that uh, yet, right? And again, the derivation of this is only uh, one or two lines, so I strongly advise you to revisit these three cases here. And uh, so when the posterior mode or the posterior mean or the posterior median are coming from and what are the affiliated uh, loss functions that upon minimization uh, give us these different uh, point estimates. All right, so let me uh, go back to uh, discuss about uh, the limitations of the MAP estimate. And one of this has to do with uh, uh, reparameterization. So let me just mention with words what that is. is if somehow uh, you go and, and um, uh, you change uh, your parameter by some function, so you reparameterize the problem, so you change from one variable to another through some function, then it comes up that the map estimate for the new parameterization does not actually uh, agree with the map estimate uh, before the reparameterization. So let me, uh, we already have seen this actually, and it is uh, given, there is a discussion in earlier lectures. So let me just remind you what the problem is. Say that, um, uh, let's start with the reparameterization of the, the posterior in general. So if you have, let's say the posterior uh, in a random variable x and you do a reparameterization by defining y to be some function f of x. I remind you for uh, scalar uh, random variables, real uh, random variables, we have seen the, that the PDFs uh, don't transform as functions, they transform as you see on, on uh, this equation. So the PDF changes and what happens is if you try to um, compute the map estimate of x, uh, uh, so maximizing p of x, uh, 
and then you try to maximize P of Y to find the map estimate uh, Y hat. The Y hat and X hat don't actually follow this function F that you see here. And to be more precisely, uh, uh, this is not equal to that. So Y hat is not equal to F of X uh, hat. So when um, uh, you do map estimation, you have to be very careful with uh, what time of parameterization you use, because when you change the parameterization, the map estimate basically changes. So, uh, uh, so the map estimation, it's uh, very prone to, to this uh, issue of uh, reparameterization. And I think uh, without going to details, um, this is maybe the same example that I had shown you in an earlier lecture. If you take X to be um, a Gaussian, and you change uh, x to y through this function. And uh, uh, so that's the function here that you see with this blue heavy uh, line. Um, so if you um, uh, take the map estimate uh, for p of x and you map it through this function, you notice it does not uh, agree uh, with the map estimate of the distribution p of y. And the reason is actually when you try to compute the map of this, when you try to maximize this with respect to y, there will be a contribution coming from the Jacobian, and that co contribution basically will result to the fact that y hat is not equal to the f uh, of x hat. So this is, again, something that uh, you need uh, to pay attention, uh, and um, uh, again, uh, you can look further in the slides uh, to see discussion on uh, this issue, but let me give you uh, a few more uh, examples. Let me take um, uh, a Bernoulli likelihood with uh, a uniform prior. So uh, the probability of heads uh, is uh, mu, and uh, my prior on mu is a uniform, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to do different, uh, uh, you know, uh, parameterizations for uh, this probability of uh, heads of mu, and uh, see what happens as I change, um, you know, so uh, if I don't have any data, right, and somebody asks you, what is the map estimate? Obviously, the map estimate will uh, agree with the mode of the prior because I don't have any data. And because the prior is uniform, uh, then the map estimate can be anywhere in the interval 0 to 1. Okay, we will agree on that. Now, if you go and uh, you introduce the following parameterization, if you introduce theta to be square root of mu, so theta still will be between 0 uh, and 1. Uh, the Jacobian comes to be 2 times theta, and if you do the calculations, the probability in theta will be 2 times uh, theta, and then you can see immediately that the map estimate, so the estimate of theta that maximizes this distribution, is uh, theta hat uh, equal to 1. Okay? Um, if you go and do another parameterization, a little bit different, and you take theta to be 1 minus square root of 1 minus mu, you compute the Jacobian, you compute pi of theta, uh, and you try to maximize this, now you will see that the map estimate is uh, theta hat equal to 0. So changing the parameterization leads completely to different uh, estimates for the map um, uh, calculation, and that's not very good, right? So you have to be concerned as to uh, what type um, of parameterization that you use. We may discuss this in a follow-up slide, but in case it is not, let me just uh, say that this type of reparameterization is, is not an issue when you compute the maximum likelihood uh, est estimate for the parameters, because I remind you the MLE estimate um, treats the likelihood as a function of the parameter and, uh, and, uh, and as not as a probability density that you try to maximize. As a result, the MLE estimate does not have any issues uh, with this parameterization. Uh, actually, let me also say that when you compute the predictive distribution, you remember the predictive distribution is the likelihood times uh, the posterior d theta, and then you integrate over the whole uh, space of the parameters. Because you have posterior times d theta, uh, which is the probability mass, when you reparameterize uh, theta, the probability mass is, is conserved. As a result, the predictive distribution is not affected by parameterization. 
Okay, so this is again very interesting. The map estimate is being affected by the predicted distribution um, uh, is not. All right. Um, now the uh, there are uh, various ways to actually address uh, this um, uh, issue with uh, parameterization, and one of them is to actually modify uh, your objective function, and rather than computing the theta map that uh, maximizes the likelihood times the prior, uh, you can actually optimize uh, the criterion that you see here, where i of theta is what is called uh, the Fisher uh, information matrix. So um, we may see a lot of, uh, of this later on when uh, if we summarize uh, the different prior models that uh, we can use in our problems. But the Fisher information, think of it of this as being the expectation with respect to the data distribution of the uh, minus the second um, derivative with respect to theta of the log likelihood. All right, that's what um, I of theta is, and this is the determinant of the Fisher uh, information matrix. It comes out that actually, if you define theta hat to be uh, uh, the estimate that maximizes uh, this criterion here, uh, that uh, somehow you don't have uh, an issue with reparameterization and the estimates remain the same. Okay. Um, now, uh, this is very nice and uh, it was proposed uh, uh, this as a sensible point estimate, but keep in mind, of course, here you have to compute the Fisher information matrix and you have to solve this optimization problem, which is certainly not as easy as computing the map uh, estimate. All right, so let's talk a little bit uh, about um, um, uh, uncertainty. So, you know, we computed point estimates. So a sensible thing to do is once we have the posterior to also, in addition to the different point estimates, uh, to be able to say something about uh, confidence intervals. And uh, one of the things we can do is uh, we can introduce what's called the creditable uh, central interval. So let me uh, give you uh, the definition. So uh, this is this credible interval alpha is the interval uh, in uh, the parameters from L to U, left uh, and, and uh, right, or lower and upper, if you like, limits, uh, where uh, this uh, uh, probability of theta being in that interval is 1 minus alpha. Okay? Uh, so we're looking at an interval between L to U, where um, this here I should have uh, written it uh, better. This is not a density, right? This is uh, the probability of theta being between L and U, given my data D, so I'm uh, still looking on my posterior distribution. This is 1 minus alpha, and I call this um, the credible interval alpha, C alpha. Obviously, you can uh, think that there are many uh, intervals that someone can use like this, and in practice we use what is called a central interval, where um, uh, if this is 1 minus alpha, uh, the area to the left of this interval uh, under my PDF is going to be alpha over 2, and the area to the right of this will be alpha over 2, the same way we had seen this with the Gaussian distribution uh, many lectures uh, many lectures ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to remind you the calculations that we had seen for the Gaussian for these uh, central uh, intervals. So if we take um, the standard Gaussian, I remind you the central interval, 95% uh, uh, interval is between minus 1.96 and plus 1.96. Usually we approximate this as minus 2 and plus 2. And for a general uh, Gaussian of the form mu sigma square, uh, the, uh, this uh, central 95% uh, interval is uh, mu plus minus 2 sigma. So if this Gaussian represents the posterior of my parameters, then actually this will be our formal uh, definition for the central 95% credible interval for this posterior. Okay, so in some sense, uh, what you see uh, here is very much uh, similar to what we had discussed uh, before for the Gaussian, but of course you can do this for uh, all the distributions. So for example, if your posterior turns out to be a beta distribution, so for example, you can see here um, uh, I am um, doing um, uh, a coin toss uh, experiment. I'm collecting 100 uh, trials 
47 heads and uh, I'm assuming here uh, a uniform beta prior uh, parameters 1 and 1 so you can show that the posterior has parameters 48 and 54 and actually if you go and you compute the central interval the 95% interval it comes to be the interval 0 0.3749 and 0 0.5673 I would strongly suggest that you try to do this type of calculations or write a little computer code to actually compute this for you because these uh, intervals are very uh, important for the, um, you know, they are very important for uh, um, uh, quantifying the uncertainty in the point estimates um, uh, that you use uh, to summarize the posterior. All right. Um, so uh, you can actually use uh, Monte Carlo uh, methods to compute this, uh, let's say, 95% uh, central uh, uh, credible uh, intervals. So effectively, uh, what you will do is, um, and I'm not going to do the derivation because we haven't really discussed uh, formally uh, Monte Carlo methods, but uh, it will be very trivial to show the calculation. Let's say that you draw from your posterior uh, capital S samples, okay, and we want to define the alpha central credible interval. So on the tails, we're going to have an area under the distribution A alpha over 2 on the left and 1 minus alpha over 2 uh, on, uh, um, I'm sorry, so we're going to have an area alpha over 2 on the left and alpha over 2 on the right. So the uh, points, um, that will define basically the interval will be this alpha over 2 and 1 minus alpha over 2, okay? So here's what you're going to do. You're going to uh, collect N, uh, uh, S, capital S samples from your posterior, and then uh, you're going to define your lower and upper limit for this uh, alpha credible interval to be S times alpha over 2 and S times 1 minus alpha over 2. And you may ask me, for example, where are these numbers coming? Okay. Um, well, uh, uh, let's let's look. You know, if you think about it, for those who are familiar with um, uh, Monte Carlo methods, right? If you are collecting capital S samples, it's like approximating uh, the um, posterior distribution with this delta function center on each sample, and uh, weighting uh, each of these uh, delta functions. Uh, with a weight uh, 1 over s. So when you integrate that um, sample uh, version of the posterior distribution from minus infinity to s times alpha over 2, what actually you're going to get, you're going to get 1 over s, which is your weight, times s times alpha over 2. The s will cancel out. So the area uh, up to this sample is going to be alpha over 2. And similarly, the area up to this sample, all right, is going to be uh, 1 minus uh, alpha over 2. Okay, so we're basically uh, using uh, as s the total number of samples. And, and if we want the alpha credible uh, interval, simply is defined as uh, s times alpha over 2, uh, comma s 1 minus alpha over 2. Okay. Again, you can um, uh, compute um, uh, the area uh, to the left uh, and to the right uh, of this interval, and you will see that those two areas come to be equal to alpha over 2. Okay. So, um, uh, let me just say that these credible intervals, they are not uh, the same as what you use in... Uh, uh, in uh, frequentist uh, statistics, okay? So in Bayesian statistics, credible intervals refer to the uh, posterior, all right? Confidence intervals are used uh, mainly in uh, frequentist uh, statistics, but somehow uh, the mechanisms of computing both of them, uh, they are very similar. But I have to say also that a lot of people that are, um, you know, uh, you know, that... Uh, somehow uh, compute uh, uh, confidence intervals, you know, they confuse them with credible intervals, they're not the same. So for our case, we define the uh, credible intervals directly uh, using 
uh, our posterior distribution. So there are intervals that summarize basically the uncertainties uh, implied by our posterior distribution. Okay, so let me uh, go further and uh, uh, introduce this new concept of the highest posterior density uh, region. So what you see on uh, this uh, picture, all right, uh, is uh, some beta distribution with parameters 3, uh, 9. And uh, you see uh, uh, a central uh, interval uh, identified by these two vertical uh, blue lines. And uh, so let's say that uh, this central interval, okay, uh, contains um, um, 95 percent let's say of the uh, of the probability mass uh, uh, in uh, this distribution so what i want you to notice with this central interval uh, is that there are points outside the interval certainly i can recognize some points here where the probability density is higher right the probability density is higher than uh, uh, you know um, than uh, uh, points that are inside the interval so basically, there are points in outside the interval that have higher probability density, but they are not incorporated in the central uh, interval. And in some sense, uh, that's not very, um, you know, very appealing. So we need to resolve this issue of having points uh, outside the credible interval that have a higher probability than points um, uh, inside the interval. So how we're going to do this? We're going to do this by defining what is called the higher uh, posterior density uh, regions. So let me try to formally define this with this equation, right? So let's concentrate directly on this equation. So you can think again that uh, uh, we're looking, let's say, um, at this 95% um, um, uh, credible uh, interval. So alpha is uh, 0 0.05 in our case. So what does this formula say is uh, that uh, we want to find an interval um, so we and we find this integral by integrating the parameter space over uh, the domain where the posterior is greater than some value p star. So in that interval, all the values of theta, all right, uh, in the posterior give us a probability that is greater than uh, a given value p star. So that way, when we define the interval this way, we're not going to have the situation where we have points outside the interval that have. Uh, uh, density that is higher than uh, other points inside the, uh, the central interval. So again, we want when we integrate the posterior for all points of theta that give us density higher than p star to get uh, a probability mass that is 1 minus alpha. Now, if you solve this optimization for problem and you identify what that p star is going to be, then your uh, high probability density interval is nothing else but the thetas, um, the interval theta for in which the probability of theta given your data is greater than p star. Okay, so through the first equation we identify what p star is and through the second equation we identify this high probability density uh, interval that you see. Now, if you do this computation for um, the problem uh, that I saw you before with the beta distribution, you can actually get uh, a high pr uh, density uh, probability density interval that uh, is defined by these two red lines. Um, you can see actually that um, uh, this uh, interval is uh, uh, a little bit more narrow than the uh, central uh, uh, interval uh, that you see on the left. Okay, but nicely. Uh, the, by definition, practically, all uh, you notice uh, that uh, all the points outside this interval have probability density that is less than the points that they are inside this high probability density uh, region. So still, uh, this uh, region here contains, let's say, 95% uh, uh, of the uh, probability mass, and it is a little bit more appealing than uh, the interval the central interval that you see on the left. So these uh, HPD uh, intervals are the ones that they are preferred for uh, posterior distributions and they are the type of um, uh, statistics uh, and, and you know, uh, confidence in, uh, uh, regions that you will need to provide to summarize the uncertainties captured by your posterior distribution. 
Now, uh, nothing, of course, is uh, uh, rosy, you know, with uh, anything. So, for example, uh, here is another, let's say, 95% uh, central interval, um, okay, on the left. And, um, and I'm, I'm plotting this uh, high probability density 95% region on the right. And what is new on the pictures here is that the distribution is by model. And you notice, very unfortunately, this high probability density region now is disconnected. Okay, so uh, you have um, this region and this region. Okay, uh, together they define uh, the HPD uh, interval. So this is not uh, very um, uh, nice. Uh, and uh, uh, and actually, it may be computationally not an easy thing to uh, to calculate. Okay, so obviously, to compute these uh, HPD intervals, you're going to have to solve an optimization problem. Uh, most uh, statistical uh, software uh, does this for you, so you don't have to worry. So, if you're using software that already has these libraries for HPD calculation, uh, please uh, feel free to actually. Uh, uh, use those calculations. All right, let me um, uh, give you uh, one example of um, uh, using uh, these um, uh, confidence intervals, but I'm going to, to uh, change a little bit the problem, right? So up to now, we're looking at the posterior and the parameters, and we're asking for uh, some interval to capture the uncertainty in the posterior. So what I'm going to actually uh, now do is I am going to work with some uh, function of the parameters, not the parameters themselves, okay? So let me give you the specific example coming from uh, Kevin Murphy's um, uh, textbook. So, you know, you're about to buy a book from Amazon, okay? And um, uh, the book is offered by two sellers. One of them has uh, 90 positive reviews and 10 negative, and the other one has two positives and zero negatives, and you want to make uh, a mathematical model that will tell you uh, which seller to use. And of course, uh, if you look at this, uh, maybe your first uh, decision would be, oh, I'm going to go with the seller too, because he has no negative reviews, but then you may be concerned because the second uh, seller has only um, uh, two reviews, right? And uh, the, uh, the seller one has uh, 100 reviews, so maybe this will actually tell you that you need sort of uh, to use your Bayesian knowledge to come up with a better answer as to what seller to use to buy your book. All right, so uh, let's do the, the following thing. Let's define um, the uh, theta one and theta two to be the reliabilities of the two sellers, okay? And uh, obviously, the data that we had, all right, were data that uh, tell us something about the posteriors of theta 1 and theta 2. So we're going to incorporate those, uh, those likelihoods with an uninformative beta prior for theta 1 and theta 2, all right? And uh, when you do all of this uh, together, you can immediately see that the posteriors of theta 1 and theta 2 are given by these nice beta distributions that you see here, all right? One is beta 9111, the other one beta 31. And then you want to compute the probability of theta 1 greater than theta 2, given your data d. So effectively, um, uh, you want to compute some function, right? And the function that really you want to compute here is uh, literally an indicator function that tells you if theta 1 is greater than theta 2. And uh, so this probability that uh, the posterior probability that uh, theta 1 is greater than theta 2 is nothing else but this uh, integral under the two posterior distributions of this indicator function. And now you can actually start thinking on uh, multiple ways of computing this um, um, interval. Of course, you know, you can compute the posterior of theta 1, you can compute the posterior of theta 2 and see in which interval the posterior of theta 1 is greater than the posterior of theta 2. Another way is to uh, use a Monte Carlo um, uh, calculation for this integral, so effectively uh, take uh, samples of theta 1 and theta 2 from these two posteriors and, uh, and then count how many samples, for how many samples you actually have theta 1 greater than theta 2, and that will be uh, another approximation that you can use to compute uh, uh, this um, uh, high probability uh, density region where uh, delta is uh, greater than zero.
so these calculations are given in um, uh, the you know are given in uh, the slides and you can uh, revisit them okay um, so um, again you can do the Monte Carlo approximation you can actually uh, plot the uh, two posteriors and see in which interval theta 1 is greater than theta 2 so it comes out um, uh, that uh, the uh, this probability of delta being greater than zero given your data is equal to, if I can see the number, is equal to uh, point, uh, uh, 0.718, okay? So this is this probability, this posterior probability is 0.718. And again, you can compute this probability uh, in uh, multiple ways uh, uh, using either uh, Monte Carlo or working directly with the posteriors of uh, theta 1 uh, and theta 2. Now, on the left of this picture, you also see uh, the 95% credible interval uh, for uh, this posterior probability. Okay, So this is the 95% uh, credible interval for the probability that data is greater than 0 given uh, your data D. Okay. Um, now we need to keep uh, moving and, and um, um, we need to move to uh, a rather new topic, okay? And that is the topic of uh, model selection, which is extremely fundamental in uh, Bayesian, uh, in Bayesian um, uh, uh, inference. You know, up to now, we have uh, spent too much time talking about the posterior of the parameters, but you really have to keep in mind what you're really interested in is to do predictions so that's where the Bayesian calculations start with a predictive distribution. So today we need to talk a little bit about model selection. And what I mean model selection, imagine that you fit your data with some polynomials. You may ask, you know, um, you know what uh, polynomials should I use? Should I use linear, quadratic, cubic, you know, or as we will see later when we do regression, you know, you're going to be using some regularization. Should I use a small regularization parameter, a high regularization parameter? All of this, the selection of regularization parameter, the selection of the order of the polynomial, they define what we call the model complexity. Okay, and uh, so uh, what we're interested in is not simply to fit uh, the data, but uh, to actually uh, uh, you know, identify the proper uh, complexity uh, uh, of the model, okay? And uh, remember when you do uh, ma maximum likelihood uh, uh, estimation, uh, we talked about uh, overfitting, right? And the idea is um, if I fit, let's say, polynomials uh, to some data, the higher the polynomial, the order of the polynomials, the, hard, the higher the likelihood um, so uh, that's how you uh, take yourself to overfitting, right? And um, um, uh, this is not what we want, right? We want somehow to be able to control the complexity of the model while at the same time we try to uh, do our best job in interpreting uh, the data that, uh, that we have at hand. So the way that uh, usually we do this in, in machine learning is... Um, you know, if we have, uh, let's say, different orders of polynomials, these are our different models and we try to fit the data, we test all of these um, uh, models using what's called a training set, right? So we optimize each of these models uh, using uh, uh, a training set, okay? So we train a range of modes, of models. And then uh, once each model is uh, trained, uh, we actually compare them uh, using what's called a validation uh, set. So that's another uh, data set, a smaller size data set that uh, we use it uh, to uh, validate uh, the models and potentially to fine tune uh, hyperparameters uh, in the model. And once we do a model selection, we say that's the best model based on the validation set, then we actually, to be sure we avoid overfitting, we're going to have a third uh, uh, set of data, which we call the test uh, set, where we're going to measure the performance. Uh, so the performance of the model is measured on the test data set, not on how well you fit your data, not on your training set or the validation, but the test uh, data set. Uh, in the traditional way of uh, doing um, uh, sort of non-Bayesian uh, 
um, uh, model selection, uh, uh, the community is using what's called uh, cross-validation that you may already heard uh, before. So effectively, what you do is if you have a big collection of data that I indicate here with uh, each row here, you split this big collection of data that you have uh, in um, equal uh, groups. And in this case, I'm splitting it to four groups. And then, you know, what you will do is you will train your model on uh, three of these uh, uh, data sets, uh, okay, that you see here, and then um, try to validate your model on the remaining data set that is this red color uh, that you see here. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is what we call leave one out uh, cross-validation because we train the model in uh, uh, everything but this uh, part of the data set, all right, where we do validation. And we repeat this by changing uh, the part of the data set where the validation occurs. Uh, and this is, again, this what you see on the schematic is what is called a fourfold cross-validation or in general, if you split your data sets in S equal parts is an S-fold uh, cross-validation. Uh, so when you do this, effectively, uh, you uh, report uh, your performance. Um, uh, maybe you report an average performance on uh, over... Uh, all these um, uh, different uh, situations that you see here. So in our case, we have uh, uh, four different uh, uh, situations uh, uh, that differ on the uh, data, on the group of the data that we do the validation. So if you average the performance in all four cases, uh, this is what uh, you report when you do cross-validation. Now, um, this is sort of not um, uh, a Bayesian uh, way to do things because in a, in a Bayesian way of doing things, you only have one data set and you want to use all of it, uh, not to leave anything out. You want to use all of it for uh, training um, uh, for training your model. Uh, but uh, still, uh, you may see even in Bayesian papers, people are reporting uh, cross-validation because effectively, uh, it is such a standard technique that a lot of the reviewers of papers uh, will expect to actually to see something like that. Okay, um, so um, uh, so that's uh, cross validation, and um, uh, so let's you know. So we we discussed that um, uh, we need uh, something that uh, will control the complexity or the capacity of the model. And the likelihood uh, uh, cannot do this because the higher the complexity of the model, the higher the um, you know the, the likelihood. So we need some criteria that somehow balance how well we fit um, uh, the data uh, versus the complexity of the model. And I'm going to give you um, uh, a very early criterion because we don't need any background, and that is what is called the Akaike information uh, criterion. This is the AIC uh, criterion, and effectively it says, um, select the model complexity by maximizing the log likelihood uh, minus M, uh, where M is uh, the number of parameters in your model. All right, so you can think uh, if you're doing, um, you know, uh, uh, polynomial regression, M uh, can be how many coefficients you have in your polynomial, all right? So the higher the order of the polynomial, the more the coefficients. And... Uh, this is the log likelihood, and you notice uh, the parameters where I compute the log likelihood are the uh, maximum likelihood uh, estimate, uh, WMLE, uh, okay? So you notice uh, this criterion is extremely simple. It says if you want to maximize this, um, yes, uh, you should maximize uh, the uh, log likelihood, okay? But at the same time, you should minimize the complexity of the model. So in essence, you're trying to find the balance between uh, the model that best fits the data, but the model that is not very complex. And we will see even in a Bayesian setting, uh, we will try to actually formally derive some criteria because what you see here is fully empirical, but we will try some criteria uh, to derive some criteria that they will look very similar uh, to the formula that you see here uh, that is fully empirical, okay, and fully non-Bayesian. So, um, uh, so this is what um, uh, you know uh, we're going to try to do, and this is extremely 
uh, important uh, because this idea of controlling the model complexity uh, comes in various ways. I mentioned all these examples with uh, regression uh, and the order of the polynomial, but remember there is much more to that when you do regression. Uh, we will see that we also have to do some regularization. We really need to control the the, 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 you know, the magnitude of the parameters used in the model uh, and uh, the smaller the regularization parameter that we use, uh, the more overfitting we have, so the regularization parameter will be something else that, um, uh, that we will need to uh, uh, sort of to control by doing the, this uh, uh, Bayesian model selection. Okay, and uh, uh, we will do a little bit, uh, I will show you some examples in the context of regression uh, today, uh, but we will also repeat these calculations uh, when uh, uh, we start discussing about regression models. So let me uh, start becoming a little Bayesian again, right? So we have a lot of models. Uh, these models have their own parameters, and we want to pick up the best model uh, that explains the data, uh, but uh, also in, uh, in, in some way uh, controlling uh, the complexity of the model. And the way we're going to do this is by defining a posterior over models, right? So try to understand this equation here. This is posterior. You notice condition on D and M uh, implies a model. There is nowhere here uh, any parameters because the way that I wrote this equation, the parameters have been integrated out. So this is really a Vegas rule uh, written as the posterior being proportional to the likelihood, all right? Uh, for model M times a prior for the model M. And our criterion will be to select the model that actually, uh, 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 you know, maximizes this posterior of models um, uh, over, you know, given the data. Okay. So this is what we need to find. From all the models, we select uh, the one that has the highest posterior uh, probability. And the question is, how do we actually compute this? And... Um, uh, I will not very much worry about the prior over model. So, you know, for now you can take that this prior over models, maybe it's the uniform distribution. So it's one, let's say. Uh, so you can see that to compute the posterior over models, you have to find this P of D given M, which is the marginal likelihood because I don't see any parameters. So how do you compute this posterior? Uh, how do you compute this um, uh, marginal likelihood? All right. To compute the marginal likelihood, uh, you have to bring the parameters uh, out. And I remind you the marginal likelihood is literally what comes in the denominator of the Vegas rule when you compute the posterior of parameters. And uh, in the denominator, what we had is we had the likelihood given the parameters times the prior for model M, right, with the parameters integrated out. Again, what you see here. If you get rid of M, so M uh, doesn't uh, annoy you, this is the probability of the data, which is the likelihood times the prior um, with uh, the parameters integrated out. This is what I told you to wait for me to come up to the proper lecture to tell you that this marginal likelihood is extremely important uh, in the context uh, of uh, model selection, and that's where exactly we see uh, this to come uh, to, play, uh, to play a role. Um, all right, so um, so uh, so we are uh, uh, ready, sort of, to start uh, discussing uh, about um, um, uh, Bayesian model selection and see how uh, computing this posterior of the models can be uh, uh, implemented uh, in uh, in practice. Uh, okay. Um, and um, uh, uh, you will see in, in uh, many of the calculations, right, that uh, somehow uh, the parameters may not be appearing explicitly, and that's why I call this uh, the uh, marginal likelihood, okay, uh, because the implication here is that the parameters are uh, integrated uh, out. Now, um, uh, you may say, uh, can I actually uh, compute this uh, marginal uh, likelihood uh, using some uh, point estimate uh, for the parameters. So, for example, can I use uh, uh, my likelihood um, uh, with, uh, let's say, an MLE or a map estimate, all right? So can I use, actually, for my marginal likelihood this? And the answer is no, you cannot do this because this will overfit, 
okay um and um um you know uh and in in principle when you use a point estimate you compute this uh, likelihood as an approximation to the marginal likelihood the more parameters you have in the model uh the higher the marginal likelihood uh, the only way to avoid overfitting is to actually perform the integration that I had on the previous uh, uh, slide. Uh, that's the Bayesian way, and that's the way uh, that uh, avoids um, uh, overfitting. So uh, the Bayesian way, when you actually perform the integration, um, uh, it uh, uh, doesn't overfit, all right? It doesn't overfit. Uh, and um, somehow, if the model is uh, more complex, it does not necessarily imply that the marginal likelihood is going to be higher. Okay? So, if I go back to the calculation that we had on the slide, if you use a model uh, with more parameters theta, because at the end of the day you integrate this parameter theta, it doesn't imply that uh, the uh, you know, marginal likelihood. Uh, you know, necessarily will be uh, the marginal likelihood necessarily will be higher. Okay, uh, because uh, if that was the case, we will go back to the uh, uh, old way of overfitting, where the higher the complexity of the model, the higher the likelihood. So Bayesian this integration uh, avoids overfitting. Uh, all of these things uh, lead to uh, what uh, is formally called the Bayesian Occam's razor effect. Okay. And I'm going to summarize it uh, uh, on the bottom of the slide uh, that effectively it says one should pick the simplest model that adequately explains the data. So from all the models, uh, the simplest one that best explains the data is the best model. Okay, uh, And uh, uh, so don't uh, start looking for complexity as a way to justify things. Right, The simplest model uh, the model with less parameters that can explain the data is the best uh, model, and we will formally see this um, uh, uh, in a little while with calculations uh, using these posterior over models that uh, uh, I discussed a while ago. Okay. Now, uh, before I do this, um, let me just uh, take the marginal likelihood, and maybe we already have discussed this somewhere. You know, in in uh, maybe the very first. Um, uh, lecture of the course, uh, we took um, the joint uh, probability uh, density, let's say, of um, uh, my data y1, y2 to y capital N, and I used the product rule to write it uh, in terms of this uh, conditional uh, probabilities that you see here. So um, this is a P of y n condition on all the previous y's. Now. Uh, I wanted to uh, to bring you here to the idea that um, uh, somehow uh, uh, what we discuss about uh, cross validation is very much uh, related uh, to um, this uh, factorization that you see here, because in essence uh, here you're doing predictions uh, of data using uh, previous observed data. Okay. This is what you do, and this, in principle, is not very much different from what we did in cross-validation, where we train a model on one data set and then we do predictions on another data set, right? So, if the model is very complex and uh, you overfit in earlier examples, so, for example, if, let's say, you have a complex model and uh, you overfit in fitting data Y1 and Y2, obviously, the prediction for Y3 uh, is uh, going to be a very poor prediction, and you can see it um, simply by looking at this uh, 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 products rules uh, rule of uh, probability that we had seen on uh, on the early uh, lecture. Uh, and again, uh, two complex uh, models, okay, uh, lead uh, to overfitting, and uh, this equation uh, demonstrates this, um, you know, on its own as well. Okay. So let me uh, start moving uh, to discuss the, uh, the Bayesian um, uh, setting. So let's say we have uh, two models, all right, and we want to compare them, okay? So the way we're going to compare them, we're going to compute the posterior of each model, and we're going to figure out which posterior is the highest, and we will make some criteria uh, for what model to select based on uh, the ratio of the posteriors uh, of the two models given some uh, training data, uh, capital D, okay? So, um, 
uh, the models have their own parameters, theta1 and theta2. And for now, I don't want you to worry if these parameters are, um, you know, the same sort of uh, type of parameters or they're completely different nature. Not very important, but I'm going to assume that each model, and I, you notice I condition everything uh, in terms of the model that I use. So model MI has this likelihood uh, given in terms of its parameters theta i, and it has uh, its own posterior, okay? Uh, by data here, uh, my apologies, I denote them with uh, a bold x rather than um, a d, uh, okay? So um, I have priors, I have likelihoods, I have the posteriors, so I have everything I need, okay? And um, uh, if I write Vegas rule for the parameters, you notice that the marginal likelihood that is of interest to me is given in the denominator. And you remember if I use an uninformative prior for each model, basically this will give me um, up to a constant, will give me the posterior over models, okay? Uh, so let me put all of this together for the two models. So what I'm gonna do is, this is uh, the Vegas rule for the parameters for each model. And I'm going to take this marginal likelihood and I'm going to put it in the posterior uh, of the model MI given my data. So this is the likelihood, um, right? Marginal likelihood because you don't see any parameters times the prior of our model divided by P of X. And uh, you notice uh, this is another uh, marginal likelihood here, but there is no involvement of our uh, model. So uh, effectively, uh, to compute P of X, you have to average this numerator over all models MI, okay? So I'm not going to bother about P of X uh, in, in this lecture. So uh, if um, um, you remember the marginal likelihood for each model, to, the way to compute it is uh, to write it as the likelihood times the prior with the parameters integrated out. This is what I have here, okay? This is uh, literally what I have here, right? This quantity is nothing but the normalizing factor. If you take the integral of the numerator, uh, uh, this is what I have, all right? So this is uh, the marginal likelihood for model MI. And if I take the two models um, and I write their posteriors to be the, uh, the marginal likelihood times the prior, and I substitute the marginal likelihood, what I get is I get the ratio of the two posteriors is the ratio of these uh, two integrals uh, times um, the, uh, this ratio of the priors of model one divided by the prior of model two. What you see uh, on the first fraction is what is called the Vegas factor between models one and two. I denote this uh, Vegas factor one zero because usually we, uh, in the literature, we compare model one versus uh, our basis hypothesis zero, but here I could have easily used uh, the notation B with subscript one and two because I'm comparing model one and model uh, two. So the biggest factor is nothing else but the ratio of the marginal uh, likelihood of model one divided by the marginal likelihood of model two uh, and uh, obviously, in computing the posteriors, I have this ratio priors. Um, and uh, keep in mind, um, lots of times we say, okay, take them to be an informative so you don't have to bother about them. But this uh, last equation on the bottom, it tells you actually that uh, depending what priors you use for the models, you can find yourself uh, making the uh, wrong decisions because the posterior ratio, it doesn't only depend on the biggest factor, but depends also on the ratio of the priors. And, and uh, so that's something you need to be concerned. So let's do two examples. And this is the coin example. Um, I have two coins. One is a fair coin. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I'm writing this, uh, uh, you know, uh, I will assume that, uh, uh, you know, these are these uh, prior models, okay, uh, for a model M1 and a model M2. And then I'm going to collect some data. Uh, and the data, let's say, is two heads and three tails. So this sounds like actually to be a fair coin, just looking at the data sets. So if you uh, compute the Vegas factor uh, and you put your likelihood because you have two heads and three tails, the likelihood is theta square one minus theta cube, all right? And you put your two priors, uh, with the normalization factors and you compute the integrals. Uh, 
you actually get um, uh, uh, the following uh, for doing model uh, comparison. You get that the ratio of the posteriors is 2.58 times P of uh, model, uh, the prior of model 1 divided by the prior of model 2. So you can, um, um, uh, if you don't pay attention to these priors, you can actually say for this particular case that uh, model 1 uh, seems to be uh, better, right, because it has a higher posterior. Uh, but again, don't forget that the result actually depends on this ratio of these uh, priors. Now, if you have uh, the other extreme case where with the same priors your data set is only five heads, immediately you can see that maybe the model uh, 2 is the best model. And indeed, when you do, uh, you repeat the calculations, it comes out that the ratio of the posteriors is 0.13 times this ratio of the priors. And, um, you know, um, and in this case, you incline to say that uh, model uh, 2 uh, is the best model. But again, you have to be very careful uh, with these uh, priors over models, especially you have to be careful when you're using um, uh, uninformative priors, because basically with uninformative priors, uh, anything goes and you can get any sort of answers uh, that you want. Uh, the, I'm going to give you, uh, with these uh, calculations with Bayes factors, I'm going to give you a cut and paste from uh, textbooks, uh, the, what is called the Jeffrey scale for making decisions um, when comparing a model uh, 1 with uh, a model 0 uh, using the Bayes factor 1, 0. And, um, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all of this in details, but you can see that um, the, this table is very conservative. So if you want a decisive evidence for M0, the biggest factor has to be less than 100. Okay, so uh, it is not sufficient for the biggest factor to be less than one to say that you have evidence for, um, you know, model M0, right? So you can see here, if your biggest factor is between one third and N and one, uh, your evidence for M0 is very weak, okay? So, um, so you can use this table, and there is a similar table that uh, uh, uses log scales. And I'm not going to go through the slides, but basically sort of summarizes the same results uh, as given before. But it tells you um, the values of um, um, on the Jeffrey scales, but using the log of the biggest factor. Okay. So, for example, um, uh, the evidence against a zero is poor when the log of the biggest factor is between 0 and 0.5, okay? Uh, uh, above 2, the evidence is uh, decisive, um, and uh, more or less the same results as you saw on, uh, on the previous slide. Now, um, this calculation is obviously required that um, uh, you need to be able to compute this marginal likelihood, and uh, in most of the examples that we will do, we can actually do these calculations uh, exactly. As a matter of fact, uh, for all the conjugate prior examples that uh, we have seen, uh, these calculations can be done analytically. And if they can be done analytically, this is actually what you need uh, to use. So I have um, an example here of the coin tossing uh, uh, experiment where I have a fair coin. Okay. Um, so theta is the probability of heads and tails is 0.5 for the fair uh, coin. So for a fair coin, uh, the likelihood, um, the marginal likelihood is uh, one over two to a power n if I have uh, uh, n data points. Um, if you actually follow the definition of the uh, marginal likelihood, uh, the uh, likelihood given the parameters would be one over two to a power n. Right, and then you're going to have to integrate the parameters, which the integral of the parameters through the prior model will give you one. Uh, so this comes to be the marginal likelihood for the fair coin. Now, if the coin is not fair, all right, and you put some um, uh, beta prior on uh, theta, then the marginal likelihood for the um, uh, for the coin that is not fair is given by this ratio of these beta functions. And again, you may ask me, where are all these equations coming, all right? So here we have the marginal likelihood. 
And I already have discussed actually about this, how you compute it, and, and uh, we will see this formally in a slide or two. Uh, but effectively, what you see here is the denominator, right? This is the denominator in the Bayes rule for the parameters. So actually what you get, um, uh, you know, when you get rid of all the terms in theta, what you left are ratios of normalizing factors. So uh, this on the denominator is the normalizing factor of the prior. And what you see here is the normalizing factor of the posterior. And there is no normalizing factor here for the likelihood. So this ratio gives you analytically the uh, marginal likelihood for an unfair coin uh, with parameters uh, alpha 1 and alpha 0 that you can take them as uh, 1 and 1. Now, if you form the ratio of this marginal likelihood and that marginal likelihood, you can actually um, compute uh, uh, the biggest factors. And um, uh, here uh, I am plotting uh, these uh, uh, marginal likelihoods uh, versus the number of heads. Uh, okay. Um, uh, and and uh, I'm also uh, plotting uh, uh, this uh, Bayesian information uh, criterion uh, that uh, we will see in a little while. Okay, so the uh, basic basically this uh, uh, Bayesian information criterion has a form that is very similar to this marginal log of the marginal likelihood that you have uh, minus some uh, penalization uh, term. Uh, which actually in this case tends to be a constant. So uh, don't be bothered about uh, this. Okay. So we can see here that uh, when you look at the marginal likelihood, uh, when uh, the number of heads is two or three, okay, um, this, um, um, you know, this is again this um, uh, log of the marginal likelihood for model uh, M1. So um, uh, obviously, um, you can see that this is the lowest, okay? So in this case, uh, the model is uh, that you will select is the fair coin model, okay? But if you are in any of these two extremes, this probability is the highest, okay? So the coin is unfair. All right, so you can read more uh, on this example in the slides and there are little computer programs that actually uh, you, can, uh, you can play with. Okay, um, now uh, let me talk a little bit uh, about um, uh, what is called this uh, 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 Jeffries uh, Lindley uh, paradox. Okay, uh, the um, I'm not actually going to refer directly to the paradox that uh, this is a case, uh, and it's called a paradox because basically it leads to situations where. Uh, when you try to do model comparison, let's say, between a model H1 and a, a reference model H0, a frequentist will come up to a completely different conclusion from uh, uh, a, a Bayesian statistician using the criteria that I already have shown you. So we're not directly going to talk about this, but what I would like to talk is, uh, is how dangerous it is to actually um, do a model comparison when you use... Um, uh, uh, prior models that they are uninformed, okay? Because in that case, uh, I'm going to show you very briefly, you can actually get to any conclusion uh, that you want, okay? So let me uh, uh, do the following things. I'm going to take that I have um, uh, two models, okay? And uh, uh, mu0 and mu1. And uh, each of these models has its own uh, prior, right? So p of theta given mu0 is my prior for model 0. P of theta given uh, M1 is my prior for model uh, 1. And um, um, this is the marginal, the first equation that you see is the marginal uh, density uh, for my problem. And um, uh, so, you know, if you try to compute this um, uh, marginal uh, likelihood that we had before, so what you will need is, um, uh, I'm sorry, so this will be the posterior, right, of model M0 given my data D. So this will be the marginal likelihood times the prior model M0 divided by the normalization factor. So I call the prior for model M0 to be rho and the prior of M1 to be uh, uh, 1 minus rho, okay? So I'm substituting those. Uh, 
uh, nothing special and have, have substituted also my marginal uh, likelihoods okay and uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assume that the priors for these models are improper okay so I am going to take the prior for model M0 to be some constant C0 and the prior for model M1 to be some constant C1. So I'm going to substitute those in the calculation of the posterior of model M0. And this is what you get. So you get a posterior for model M0 that somehow depends strongly, as you can see, for uh, the ratio of these constants C1 and uh, C0. So effectively, uh, you're getting to this uh, conclusion here that using this um, uh, improper um, uh, priors uh, somehow uh, can give you a completely misleading result for these posteriors over models, uh, which means can also give you uh, very strange results for the Bayes factors because, in essence, uh, depending on what values of sigma 1 uh, and sigma 0 uh, you use, this posterior here can take any value, all right? It can take any value. So um, what I want you to remember from this uh, slide is somehow uh, don't want you do model selection or model comparison, do not use uh, improper priors, okay? So do not use improper priors uh, because you may come up with conclusions that they're completely uh, erroneous. Uh, Certainly, the biggest factors uh, favors the simplest uh, model. That's the Occam's razor uh, principle. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that the probability of observing uh, data under a complex model, in particular with a diffuse prior, is, is, uh, is very low. Okay? So, um, uh, so that's as much as I wanted to say about using improper priors and, and um, uh, doing model comparison, uh, you need to be careful uh, with that uh, calculation. Okay, uh, let me go now and uh, discuss this Bayesian Occam's razor uh, uh, a little bit more uh, in detail. So we're going to assume that we have models of different complexity, and uh, I denote here these uh, different models as uh, M1. All right, that's model M1. Uh, this is uh, the red is M2, and the blue is uh, model M3. And uh, these models, we have um, uh, different complexities. So M1 will be a simple model. And to me, a simple model means a model that can only express, uh, can only explain a few data sets D. That's what this axis is on the bottom. So this simple model can only explain a few data sets. The rent uh, uh, model is an intermediate complexity model and can explain a few more data sets than the simple model and M3 can uh, explain uh, way more data sets because a complex model, okay? But you notice uh, the probability of M3 explaining any of these uh, data sets D is lower. And why is that uh, lower? Because uh, M3 has to explain a lot of data sets. So it has to assign to each of these data sets a low probability because the sum of the probabilities over all possible data sets, right, has to be equal to 1. Okay, so M2 is a simple model, it assigns high probability on very few data sets. M2 assigns, um, uh, explains a little bit more data, and in this particular case, uh, M2 can explain the data D0, which is our observations, when the model M1 cannot really explain, or it can explain D0, but with very, very low probability. So M2 has a high probability. It's an intermediate complexity uh, 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 model. And that's what this uh, Bayesian Occam's razor principle says, that uh, for all the models, choose the one that best explains the data and uh, has the, uh, uh, it's as simple as possible, okay? And uh, uh, again, the key ingredient in, in uh, coming up with this uh, uh, principle is this conservation uh, of uh, uh, probability states, if you like. Uh, the models that uh, explain many data sets must assign to each of these data sets uh, a small probability because the sum uh, of these probabilities in explaining each data set have to be uh, turning equal to one. Let me show you this 
in, in a context of a regression problem. And I know we haven't done anything yet about regression, but I can use your imagination. So here is a simple model. It's a straight line. Here's a parabola, an intermediate complexity uh, model. And here's a high uh, mo uh, complexity model that overfits that somehow um, uh, passes through all the training uh, data sets. Uh, obviously, you can affiliate M1, M2, and M3 with the pixel that you see on uh, the left. Uh, but the way these uh, pixels are coming from a nice ICML uh, tutorial of uh, uh, Zubin uh, Garamani. Um, and um, uh, I very much like these uh, pictures because uh, sort of they contain the essence of uh, Bayesian model selection and controlling uh, this complexity with uh, uh, versus overfitting your data. Okay, so there is uh, particular regression examples that I give you in the slides that you can uh, uh, look at. And um, uh, since we haven't uh, done anything about regression yet, so I'm going to try to describe them in a high level. I am using, um, so I have, uh, you know, models of polynomials of different orders. I'm using uh, a Gaussian prior for its model. And um, um, so I have uh, five uh, training data points that you see here. And uh, the, um, you know, uh, the solid green curve that you see is uh, the uh, actual uh, true function that is uh, used to generate with some noise the, the models, I mean the data. And uh, the last picture on the bottom uh, right, it gives you the posterior over models. And in this particular case, it turns out for this uh, five data points, the best model that explains uh, the data is actually a straight line, okay, and uh, and uh, so it's a linear uh, function that explains the models. Obviously, this is a Bayesian model, so there is uncertainty in the regression coefficients, as we will see, and these dotted lines are plus minus, uh, as, uh, you know, one sigma, which is the predictive uncertainty for this regression model. We will see more about this when we do regression. For now, uh, what is important is that somehow we compare the different models and these posterior over models tells me for this particular case that the linear function is the best uh, regression function that I can use uh, uh, for this situation. Now, if you have more data points, as you can see for the same example, now it turns out that the posterior over models, it's actually maximized for the quadratic function. So the best regression function is actually uh, this uh, uh, quadratic function. Okay, um, let me uh, uh, finish up by uh, uh, telling you a little bit more about uh, this uh, model evidence, right? So uh, remember the model evidence is what we need to compute the posterior over models, all right? And um, uh, the, um, you know, uh, the calculation for this, um, um, you know, uh, for this model evidence basically follows the formula that uh, you see here on the bottom, okay? So what I need to do is I need to um, to be able for each model to calculate the normalizing factor uh, in the Bayes rule for the posterior of the parameters, okay? This is what this is, right? So if you forget M, this is an integral of the likelihood times the prior integrate over the parameters. So that's the normalizing factor that I use it okay, that I use in, uh, when I compute the posterior of theta given my data set D. And I already uh, explained uh, in an earlier lecture that if you look at the posterior um, and you substitute all the terms uh, in all uh, the expressions for the posterior, the prior, and the likelihood, everything in terms of theta and whatever is left, you leave it out as a normalization factor. You can write the posterior as some function of theta divided by the normalization of the posterior, that's Zn. You write the prior as some function of theta divided by a normalization for the prior, and you do the same thing for the uh, likelihood. And then what you are left is P of D, right? This is my marginal likelihood, and it turns out that for all of these problems, the marginal likelihood is the ratio of the normalization factor Zn of the posterior, divided by the normalization factor Z0 of the uh, prior uh, times the normalization factor uh, ZL uh, of the likelihood. 
And uh, certainly I can do all of these uh, calculations of this is analytically for all the cases where we use uh, conjugate priors. Okay, and uh, I'm very fast going to go through uh, as a reminder of some of these uh, calculations. So when we use uh, the binomial likelihood, right? So in N experiments, we collect N1 heads and N0 tails. We use a beta prior. Uh, the posterior is going to come to be uh, a beta uh, posterior with parameters alpha plus N1 and beta plus N0. And it turns out that the marginal likelihood is given by this nice formula. Immediately you recognize this the uh, being the, the um, uh, marginal, you know, being the this um, uh, integration term, right? The normalization term in the likelihood. This is the normalization term in the posterior, and this is the normalization term in in uh, in the prior model. Okay, I can do the same thing for a Dirichlet multi nulli distribution, and here is the answer. Right, so I'm not going to bother, and I think it was only one or two lectures ago that I gave you this uh, for um, uh, uh, you know when we play with uh, uh, you know Bayesian inference for uh, a multivariate uh, Gaussian uh, distribution, and we did Bayesian inference for um, uh, both the um, you know the mean and the covariance or the mean and uh, the precision metrics. We computed the normalization factors for the posterior, uh, for the prior and the likelihood. And, um, you know, and uh, what you see here is for, uh, you know, uh, for uh, a likelihood that is a multivariate Gaussian uh, that follows this normal inverse we wizard uh, prior, right? So normal inverse wizard um, uh, prior. I have given you all the results before, so uh, we can compute the marginal likelihood analytically. Okay, we can compute the marginal likelihood analytically. Uh, okay, it's nice that these results can be done analytically, right? So you know, remember, if it's something analytical, you cannot go and start uh, uh, using numerical approximations because people are not going to be happy. But certainly, uh, in the literature. For complicated posteriors, when you want to do uh, model selection, uh, one of the ways you can do it is uh, approximating the integrals that are involved in the marginal likelihood with Monte Carlo integration, and potentially we will see some homework problem coming your way uh, to do this type of calculations uh, very shortly. Okay. Um, I am pra practically done, so I uh, on this extremely long lecture, let me give you uh, the final um, uh, important item, which is, uh, you know, we talk about the uh, posterior of the parameters and uh, the posterior of the parameters was coming, the predictive distribution. So any simplification that somebody can introduce in that posterior, that would be fantastic. And the best simplification you can have is it's a Gaussian approximation of that posterior. So a Gaussian approximation uh, of, a, of a posterior, P of theta given the D, is basically fitting a Gaussian in the mode uh, of, the, of the true posterior, all right? Um, so uh, it's a Gaussian that uh, fits in the mode, and uh, it uses uh, uh, a precision that is uh, minus the second derivative uh, of the uh, log posterior calculated at the map estimate. I said a lot of things uh, there, um, so let me just uh, put this with uh, other words, right? If you take the log uh, posterior of the parameters, so if you take log of uh, the posterior of theta m given your data d, and you do a Taylor series expansion, you're going to get a constant term that you don't care because it will lead to a normalization term. You will get the gradient of the log of the posterior computed at the map estimate, and that is zero by definition of the map estimate. And then you get a quadratic term that involves the second derivative that gives you basically uh, the precision of a Gaussian. And this is the Gaussian that fits uh, the posterior around the map estimate. So what do you need to get the Laplace approximation in place? You need to compute the map estimate and you need to compute the second derivative of the log posterior at the map estimate. Okay. And that is your Laplace approximation uh, for the posterior. Now, 
Uh, I'm going to give you one immediate example of how uh, useful can be the Laplace approximation because once you have the Laplace approximation, I can use it to compute the marginal likelihood uh, directly or approximate the, the marginal likelihood. So what is the marginal likelihood, if you remember, is, uh, uh, is the likelihood, all right? So I'm looking at model uh, mu m, so the marginal likelihood is uh, the likelihood times uh, the prior for model m. Uh, divided by the posterior, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, uh, logs of this equation and I'm going to approximate uh, everything uh, at my point estimate theta map, okay? So this term here, the first one is nothing else but the log of the first term that you see here. This term here is not anything but the log of the prior but compute at the map estimate. And then I have minus log of my posterior and uh, what I do is I use the um, Laplace approximation. And remember, I am going to evaluate everything at theta map. So this quadratic term will disappear because I have theta map minus theta map. So what I'm left is, uh, is an approximation of the marginal likelihood that uh, is given uh, as an approximation uh, is very convenient because it is given by the log likelihood computed at the map estimate. Notice that I have the parameters here. So this is not a marginal likelihood. It is the likelihood computed at the uh, map estimate. I have the prior computed at the map estimate. And then I have a uh, uh, log of uh, A, of the determinant of A, that requires those second derivatives uh, of the uh, log um, uh, of the log posterior uh, computed at the map estimate. Okay, so what you see here is uh, a Laplace approximation to uh, uh, a Laplace approximation to the model evidence or uh, marginal likelihood, and uh, we can actually take this approximation uh, even further with more simplifications. So let me do that for you. Remember uh, what you see here, right? What you see here is um, uh, the uh, likelihood computed at the map estimate. So that's something uh, very easy to do. And here what I have is I have um, uh, the log of the determinant of A. Okay. Uh, now, remember that uh, A, um, remember that, uh, you know, this uh, posterior is uh, that involves is involved in this calculation for A. Uh, is uh, it is the likelihood, all right, uh, times the prior, and for a lot of data. So as n goes to infinity, the likelihood uh, overwhelms uh, the prior. So effectively, I can actually say that this matrix A of the second derivatives of the log of the posterior, as n goes to infinity, they grow as n times a zero, where a zero corresponds to some matrix uh, that is constant. Okay. Uh, why I do this? Because as n goes to infinity, I can approximate the log of the determinant of a as the log of the determinant of n times a0. And this will give me uh, d, the dimensionality of the problem times log of n, plus the log of this determinant of the fixed matrix, which asymptotically be, uh, becomes d log of n. Okay? So, um, so asymptotically, basically, I can get rid of the need to calculate explicitly uh, uh, this determinant of A coming from the Laplace approximation, and I can simplify my uh, evidence now, my log evidence, uh, using the Laplace approximation as the log of the likelihood computed at the map estimate. The prior, when I have a lot of data, this will be uh, irrelevant, right? It'll be too small. Uh, and then from this term, I have d log of n. This only involves d, so it's very small. So this is my approximation that you see on the bottom. And this approximation to the marginal likelihood goes with the name uh, Bayesian information criterion. So if you want to compute the, uh, uh, you know, if you want to do model comparison, you want to compute the marginal likelihood uh, using the Laplace approximation, you can use this Bayesian information criterion. And so naturally you can see that maximizing this basically requires you to fit the data as well as possible through this likelihood model, but at the same time it tells you be sure uh, 
um, the complexity of the model doesn't go high up, all right? So you penalize the complexity of the model. And uh, uh, so this is extremely uh, nice way to compute uh, a very uh, useful approximation uh, for the marginal likelihood that goes under the name Bayesian information criterion. Now, uh, this Parameters D, again, D are the, um, you know, uh, the dimensionality, the, how many parameters you have in your problem. But more general, uh, and we will see this as we do different examples, you want to uh, interpret D as the effective number of parameters. And what I mean here, effective number of parameters, I mean the parameters that actually can be computed uh, from your data. Uh, we will see this uh, later uh, uh, in uh, uh, when we start doing applications. Okay, um, so um, you can, uh, you know, in, in the literature, you will see a lot of people that actually do not uh, compute this uh, Bayesian information criterion by evaluating the map estimate. So instead of the map estimate, you can actually plug in uh, anything else as a point estimate you want. You can actually plug in uh, the MLE estimate. So you may see in the literature people approximating the marginal likelihood uh, using the MLE est estimate. I will not recommend it, but you can do this uh, quite easily. Uh, let me give you uh, one example, and again, uh, you may want to revisit this example after we cover uh, Bayesian uh, regression. Uh, so imagine uh, that you're fitting um, uh, data, you have some data of X and Y, uh, Y are scalar data here, and you fit them with some regression uh, function that is of the form theta transpose X where theta are your um, regression coefficients. Uh, for those who have not seen this before, think that somehow your distribution at every x is a Gaussian centered at uh, theta transpose x, that is the regression function, with some noise uh, sigma square. And um, uh, what you can do is you can use uh, an MLE estimate uh, both for uh, the parameters theta and the noise sigma square. And I am not going to uh, discuss the details, but you know, uh, you can uh, guess that the MLE estimate for theta comes to be the least squares estimate, and the MLE estimate for uh, sigma square is uh, this uh, data uh, sum of squares that you see here. So if you plug in all of this uh, together in the approximation that we had for the, uh, for the big criterion, the big criterion uh, effectively uh, gets this uh, uh, very nice form. So if you actually want to do uh, uh, model selection or model comparison, you can use uh, this, uh, um, you know, uh, you can select a model that maximizes this uh, big criterion, okay, given by this nice um, uh, equation for a complex regression problem, but still this equation looks very simple. Now, a lot of uh, people, instead of um, uh, using uh, a maximization of the big criterion to do a model selection, they use a loss function um, or a cost function, if you like, uh, affiliated with this uh, big uh, criterion. And uh, I am not going to go through uh, uh, details because they don't think they are relevant, but basically the, uh, uh, this loss function that they use is minus, time, minus two times uh, this uh, expression that we had before for this uh, uh, Bayesian information criterion. So, um, so if you see a uh, big cost is nothing else but uh, 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 minus two times uh, what we have seen in the earlier slide. Okay, um, and, and um, so that's the Bayesian information criterion, you know, and uh, of course, uh, there are uh, other criteria that uh, uh, do approximations uh, for the marginal likelihood and allow you to do a model selection. And I will finish with this Akaike information criterion that somehow uh, does not have that factor that we noticed uh, we had before, uh, d over 2 times log of n. Now, the penalization on uh, the degrees of freedom of the system is simply minus d effectively using the notation we had from uh, uh, before. So um, uh, if you um, you know if you look carefully, the penalty uh, 
for uh, this uh, Akaike information criterion is uh, less than uh, for the Bayesian information criterion because uh, before uh, this was multiplied by log of n, all right? So that was a very big number, but here we have minus the degrees of freedom, how many parameters I have. So the penalty is less. So don't be surprised if you use the Akaike information criterion that somehow will give you uh, let's say a polynomial of higher degree than if you use the Bayesian information criterion. So the Akaike information criterion gives you higher complexity than the Bayesian information criterion, but actually some people like it uh, for that way because um, they believe that the Bayesian information criterion is, is too conservative. But remember, the Bayesian information criterion it was derived in a principal way as a very nice Bayesian approximation using the Laplace approximation of the posterior, so a Bayesian approximation for the marginal, uh, the marginal likelihood. Um, now, uh, uh, I remind you that the marginal likelihood, uh, it was basically an integral, right, of the parameters uh, of the prior times the likelihood over the parameter space. So, uh, obviously, uh, a question that uh, somebody can um, uh, bring up is, so uh, the prior model now becomes extremely important in model selection. And the answer is yes, it is extremely important. I mean, we said before that uh, uh, for many of the things we discuss, if you bring more data to your problem for training, the prior is unimportant. But uh, now for model selection, the prior is significant. It can... Uh, uh, make a big difference in model selection. So how do you go about uh, addressing this issue, uh, the sensitivity of model selection to your choice of the prior? So the idea here is that your prior has um, uh, uh, different parameters uh, itself that we call hyperparameters. So what you will do is you will actually go, since you're not certain about your prior, you're going to put another prior on the parameters of the prior. Uh, so effectively, if theta depends on some high parameters uh, alpha for this model M, we're going to go and put another prior over uh, the parameters alpha. And the idea is, if you keep doing this and you put priors and priors and priors, the effect hierarchically uh, of these priors as you keep go moving up in the hierarchy will diminish. Okay. But there is something uh, uh, even more wonderful that you can do is you can do what is called the empirical Bayes approximation that we will see uh, in a future lecture. But let me uh, bring it up now. And what is this empirical uh, Bayes approximation? Here is the idea. Since the effect now of this alpha, of this choice of this prior, uh, is less significant than the choice on the prior on uh, theta, how about if we fix the parameters alpha to a point estimate? So how about if we approximate this with some point estimate? Okay, And the question is then, uh, what point estimate do you use for alpha and how do you compute? And, uh, and here is uh, the statement, uh, uh, we're going to fix uh, the calculation of the marginal likelihood for some point estimate of the hyperparameters alpha and alpha is going to be calculated by mar maximizing uh, the marginal likelihood or evidence where uh, the evidence now you notice is written uh, as a function of alpha okay so we calculate this marginal likelihood or evidence exactly as we did before by integrating the parameters theta out. But you remember the prior on theta depends on alpha. So we're going to maximize this with respect to alpha, select a point estimate, and then plug in that point estimate in my evidence. And that will be what is called the empirical Bayes uh, approximation. Okay, so what's the empirical Bayes approximation? Use hierarchical prior models and uh, fix the uh, hyperparameters in, in uh, these models to some point estimates. And these point estimates maximize the marginal likelihood uh, introduced here in the equation on the bottom in terms of the hyperparameters uh, alpha. All right, I know there has been uh, uh, too much in the lecture today. And uh, uh, so uh, we will meet again in two days.
to discuss um, uh, further topics uh, in our course. Uh, have a good day. Bye.